five games over the rest of the season that could have the biggest impact on the NFL draft order. And let's start in week 16 because that's the week we're currently in. Panthers versus Packers. Panthers, uh, Panthers currently have the number one overall pick. That's going to go to the Bears, of course. And if Carolina wins, the chance they get the first overall pick is 55%. So if they win this week and then we have to let the next two weeks play out, they still have a 55% chance to get the first overall pick. Another important game in Week 16, uh, and it feels like almost a relegation conversation if we're talking about soccer to uh, two guys who like soccer. Relegation would be um, – it's a fun story to follow if you're a fan of a team near the bottom of the table. Bottom three get kicked out, and they they get to go down a level. This is a relegation-type battle in Week 16. Commanders at the Jets. And this will be jockeying for position inside the top 10. And potentially – and, you know, we talked about this last podcast. Commanders fans weren't happy that I had them taking a quarterback in the last mock draft I did a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah, how sides have changed. Oh, exactly. And Commanders are currently fourth. Jets are currently sixth. And I would imagine the loser, whichever team it is, would be having serious conversations about a quarterback, right? I would think so. And the Jets situation, depending on if Aaron Rodgers comes back, which he stated that he is coming back. But does he come back? I guess I'm going to ask you this, Ryan Wilson. <laughs> So formal. <laughs> 26 days, bud. Just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So let's say that the Jets decide to move on from Robert Sala. And all of a sudden, that means Nathaniel Hackett's gone, their OC, because the reason that Aaron Rodgers went to the Jets was because of Nathaniel Hackett. So let's say he's not here. How does that impact Aaron Rodgers? How does that impact the New York Jets or the new people, you know, the new potential coaching staff that would come in if they do decide to make a move in the offseason? Um, but either way, you're going to have to get a young quarterback behind Aaron Rodgers because if he plays a year or two, who knows, um, to get ready to take over once Aaron has decided to move on in life. Are you – Consulting Aaron beforehand because he was surprised when the Packers drafted Jordan Love a few years ago. Well, I I, I think they I would give him a heads up, uh, <laughs> you know, that hey, we're potentially going to take a quarterback. He's not going to be ready to play, but hopefully, be under the tutelage of you and eventually take your spot. What if he said, "I, I need you to take an offensive tackle. I don't want a quarterback." Well, that's that's the, the GM's decision to make and how he handles that. But so, they do need offensive line help. Right. But if they do address it, and I don't know the free agency market yet, but if they address it in free agency or they address it a potential trade. Um, but that's an interesting question because of the depth at the quarterback position. And let's say a, a Fashano, Fashanu is there or an Alt is there, then you almost have to take that tackle and say, we'll come back and get a swing on a quarterback later. Yeah. As if it's not Drake May or Caleb Williams, those tackles are better players than these other quarterbacks at this yeah. point. I'm going to continue to ride the Jaden Daniels train until it goes over the cliff. So. Yeah. Well, he's a good player. And, uh, but is he going to be, is he going to have an immediate impact? Now, that'll depend on, like I said, what does the New York Jets coaching staff look like next year? That's true, too. Thing, then you know they're going to have to win. So you're going to have to go. Uh, offensive tackle. If it's a new regime, which I don't know if it's going to be a new regime, who knows, you know, what's going to happen over these next three weeks, that it may be a whole different light on the subject that we're talking about. You didn't have to deal with this very often in terms of having losing records late in the season, but did you ever get a sense that there was some tension around the building because there could be oh, huge? I mean, okay, especially if you're having a losing season and there's potential of you not being there, right. It's amazing how all of a sudden all the doors are shut. Everybody's <laughs> making secret squirrel phone calls. <laughs> Who hell knows what's going on? Everybody's like, I don't know if I'm going to be here, but I better make sure that I start uh, lining up my uh, ducks in a row just in case we get blown out here. Yeah. You think about the Raider staff, you think about the Charger staff below the head coach on the org chart. Those are all guys that are probably really stressed out right now because you don't know. It, it's it's a hard part of the business because it's such a stress. And a lot of these guys have families. They have young kids. 
Uh, I know it's the life that you choose and it's part of being in the NFL is the turnover, but people don't look at the family aspect of it. And it's extremely difficult when you have to, let's say you have a, your, your kids, Ryan, let's say you're a GM and you get blown out and your kids have been in that high school or whatever school they've been, they have all their friends and you come home and say, Hey, daddy got fired today. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're moving from whatever hell hole you live in. <laughs> no, that's, that's right. Like I grew up, my dad was in the military group. So we moved frequently, not because he got fired, just because he got, they, they moved when you get in the military, you moved around every three or four years and it's tough. And you know, it's even tougher when your dad or your mom loses a job just because that's the nature of the business. And that's something that I don't think we think enough about when we're wondering why teams struggle. A lot of it in December is because guys are stressed out and everyone players included, but even above them in terms of the coaching staff and the front office staff, they're worried about how this is going to play itself out. And I, not really joke, but it, it seems to me a lot of times what turn, it turns into Game of Thrones where people are trying to cover their own uh, asses and you lose sight of the original goal because everything has gone, gone haywire. You can't say that on the air, but arses would be another arses. term to use. Yes. Yeah. So, according to Debo, can you cuss on this podcast? Cuss. Is that a cuss word? Can't you just say arses? I'll, uh, I'll let that one fly, but don't go any crazier than that. Okay. There you go. <laughs> A double S. How about that? By the way, uh, Debo notes that the Jets are hosting the Commanders and they are uh, giving the Commanders three points, and the Packers are minus four and a half against the Panthers. I know that doesn't mean anything to you, Rick. That, the- yeah, I put that Packers Panthers because that's probably the Panthers' best shot to win a game the rest of the year. Next week they have at Jacksonville, and then they close with at home versus Tampa. But this will probably be the smallest point spread for the Panthers the remainder of the season. Yep. And both those two teams, Tampa and uh, Jacksonville, are probably going to have meaningful games down the stretch here on seeding and, and winning the division. And, you know, Tampa has a big, 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 big game this week coming up. Uh, That's the Jacksonville game, isn't it? Yeah, because those two are playing against each other. It's in Tampa, and that will have huge playoff implications. And Tampa wins then they're in the driver's seat to potentially win the division. If they lose, I don't know if any of those, who knows if the, if the new Orleans saints or anyone will still be fighting for a wild card down the stretch, depending on how everything else. And I think that's one thing that makes this league so interesting is that all these games you, you, and when you're in the front office or your coaching staff, you want to have meaningful games in December. And it seems like it's so wide open with only three weeks left. You know, you look at the Detroit, Minnesota. Well, it's like a a mini NHL series or an NBA series, or yeah, maybe it's okay. Best two out of three uh, over the next two weeks. So the, I think the NFL does a phenomenal job of trying to figure out the schedule and having so many meaningful games down the stretch here. Another Week 16 game to keep an eye on from the uh, bottom looking up is Cardinals at Bears. <clears throat> Bears, God, they should have won that game uh, against Cleveland. Didn't work out for them. The Cardinals are, uh, they beat the Steelers a few weeks ago. Kyler Murray looks pretty good. Uh, they lost, of course, to the 49ers last weekend. No crime in that. That's a tough matchup. Uh, and here's the thing about Arizona. They could go 0-3. If Carolina goes 2-1 and and the Patriots go 2-1, and it is a virtual lock that Arizona will have the first overall pick. Does that change your I'm keeping Kyler Murray math if you have the first overall pick, Rick? That, that's a conversation after the season. And the Chicago, because they have the Carolina, they're more than likely going to be picking one or two or for sure in your scenario in the top three. So Chicago is going to try to win as many games as they can because they're playing on house money. They already know they got Carolina's top pick. So, But they also have to win some games down the stretch because what is the future of of, of – of Matt Eberflus as the head coach in uh, Chicago. I don't think they're going to, I think Ryan Poles will stay there as a general manager with some of the moves that he has made, but there may be a coaching change there. If you're Arizona, you have the first overall pick right now. What are you doing? Well, okay. I, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely talk about Caleb Williams, but do you trade Kyler Murray? 
if you trade him, can you afford that type of hit towards your oh, yeah, salary right. cap? You got to take into consideration the contract and the guarantees monies and what's acceleration, what's your cap look like a year, two years from now, if you make that move. So there are a lot of, if I'm Carolina, I have a number one old pick. One thing I'm doing is just like I did last year, trying to trade out of that pick and try to get as many good football players as I can to continue to build that roster. If you're a team that needs a quarterback and you're willing to entertain a trade for one of those quarterbacks, would you rather have Kyler Murray or Justin Fields? Mm, mm, very interesting. Because <laughs> uh, Justin Fields, to me, is a very good athlete. He can make all the throws. If he has weapons around him, he's gotten better this year. Uh, the reason he's gotten better is because of DJ Moore. I think he has 144 quarterback rating when he's thrown to DJ Moore. 72 or 73 quarterback rating when he's not. So imagine if I can, we decide to stay with Justin Fields and I put Marvin Harrison Jr. and DJ Moore, how much better is that going to make Justin Fields? But then the question comes back that we don't know on the outside internally, what are the issues why Justin Fields hasn't accelerated to that next level yet? Was it some durability stuff? There's no question that he makes plays with his legs. Um, but it's, is there something missing that we don't know on the outside that they know on the inside? And if they do decide to move on from Justin Fields, in my opinion, they will try to trade him before the new league year, which means that'll tell you which direction they're going with that potential number one overall pick. March 1st. Is that typically the new league year? Middle of March. Middle of March. So you didn't answer the question. I'll answer it for you. I think I would slightly lean towards Kyler Murray if I had to trade for a quarterback over Justin, but it's not a clear cut slam dunk. No, that's a lot. That's a deep dive, and it's, <laughs> it's hearsay. What we're talking about, we're just sitting yeah, we're here speculating. That's what we do. Yeah, Rick hates hearsay. Huh? Rick hates hearsay. And Ryan, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, when planning the rundown, I was just thinking about. If your stupid Steelers had just beaten the Cardinals and the Patriots, how much more fun this race for the number yeah. one overall pick would be? Absolutely. But they couldn't do it. Uh, let me ask you this, Rick, because I saw that someone mentioned this on Apple Podcast five-star reviews. And by the way, Debo notes that next week we're going to get through some of these five-star prospects. So one of the questions was, and I think I even asked you this before, but just since we're talking about uh, the Bears and what they might do, any chance you just take Marvin Harrison number one overall if no one's answering the phone? Or calling you about it? Well, it depends on how strong they feel about Caleb Williams. And you remember, this staff, this GM, did not draft Justin Fields. Right. So they really don't have any true ties to him because it's not going to cost them their job. It's not going to cost the GM his job. I didn't draft Justin Fields. Yeah. Now I'm going to draft Caleb Williams. Now, all of a sudden, Caleb Williams better come through. But since I don't have, that's a unique thing where you didn't draft Justin Fields. So you can always say, well, we got our quarterback of the future going forward. Yeah. All right. This is going to be gosh, so much to talk about. It feels like every year we have a lot to talk about. This year feels crazier than previous years. All right. Those are three games in week 16. We need to keep it on. Let's jump ahead to week 18 when things get really juicy, the final week of the regular season. Uh, the Jets are again uh, highlighted here. Jets at Patriots. Uh, there was a time three or four months ago that we thought this might decide perhaps even the division. And now it's going to decide something much less than that. Now, I don't know everybody. I wasn't, I, I thought that the Miami was going to win the division this year. Oh, okay. Not even the bills. Yeah. All right. Well, there's no threat from from, from either the jets or the Patriots to, to threaten either the bills or the, no or the dolphins. So here's the deal. If the Patriots, Go one and three. They only have a 7% chance of getting that first overall pick. They cannot win a game. If they one go and 0 and three. One and two. Learn a one and two. Sorry. Yeah. I can do the math there. There's no way they can go one and three. That part is confirmed. <laughs> if they go one and two, there's only a seven percent chance. Did you say learn the game, by the way? No, I did not say I said learn the math. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a variation of learn the game. If they go 0 and three, however, as we head into week 16, there's a 36% chance or so that they can get that first overall pick. Going to need help, of course, from the Panthers. Um, but Patri Patriots are currently number two. Jets are currently number six, as we mentioned. And then finally, week 18, and this is an important game for both teams. Buccaneers, you talked about earlier, they're making their push to hold on to the division lead. They're actually playing better than the Jaguars, I think, a team they faced this weekend in week 16. They are at Carolina. 
facing the Panthers. And the Panthers, if they go, oh, and let's see. Oh, here's fun. Here's a fun fact for you, Rick. If they go 3-0 and over these next three weeks, they only have a 2% chance, the Panthers do, of holding on to that first overall pick. So they have some incentive to finish strong. I'm sure David Tepper would like that. And the Bears are, you know, holding on to the, the center Bears, of the The Bears are rooting against them. These, and if I was the Panthers, I would do everything in my power to make sure that I don't give the Bears the number one overall pick. Yeah, you don't want to back-to-back years. Have the Bears have that opportunity for sure. So those are two important games there. When you're late in the season and things aren't going your way, is there any way to motivate yourself for a what's effectively a Week 18 homecoming game? I mean, to get get up for it, knowing that things are going to change pretty well, soon after the season. The homecoming game. I just mean that as season's lost, everyone's ready to get out of there. Is there anything you can do to motivate the the troops one last time when they know everyone's going to? Well, the motivation gonna... is you, you want your job next year from a right. player standpoint. So yeah. if you're not going to be here, they're auditioning for other teams if they're going to be free agents or not. So, yeah, you are going to play as hard as you can, and and your resume is what you put on tape. So I, it's not like we're going to walk out, just throw the ball and get through this game, and then. The cars are all heated up and ready to hit the highway right after the game. No, guys are playing, and they're playing for their jobs. Is your schedule as a GM any different if your team is out of it as opposed to going to the playoffs, or you're still doing the same things? Still doing the exact same thing. Well, in the playoffs, you're getting, you know, your scouts are doing the advanced scouting for the playoffs. you got guys going out, you know, looking at these teams that you potentially may face in the playoffs. So we would have our pro department all over the place in week 17 and 18. Okay. Gotcha. Just getting ready for a potential opponent. Cause you don't know who you're going to match up with, depending on how the rest of the regular season ends up. So that's a little different, but your college schedule, your colleagues got everything stays the same. That never changes in the calendar year. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if you were just, all right, we're going to get a head start on X, Y, and Z, but you're doing, doing what you do. Doing what you do. The That's why your schedule you're... is laid out, and not that I'm anal and like things like this. Not at all. <laughs> but the schedule, I laid it out in July, and the schedule didn't change. It may get adjusted some on if you're in the playoffs and the coaches when they start in a draft or start looking at free agent play, you know, stuff. And, you know, when you have your exit physicals and all that other stuff, if you get in the playoffs and you get bumped out. But for the most part, the schedule is – set in stone not etched in oatmeal etched in oatmeal that's a new one I yeah like that. i like that um it's funny you Ever say that something in oatmeal yeah it, it's not it, it doesn't work too good or porridge if you're in england i thought you were working on your english accent you used to throw porridge in there a few times it's funny you say that about the schedule rick because you mentioned that i would imagine debo would, would, would contend countless times because even though Debo is probably one of the most organized people we work with, it is nothing compared to the OCD anal retentive schedule you had become accustomed to over your 30 plus years in the league. Is that correct? That is very, very correct. And if this is anal retentive, what Debo puts up. It's, it's... <laughs> hey, Rick, June 17th, 2024, we're going to do the early top 200 prospects for the 2025 <laughs> class. So just so you know, make All a right, note. I'll get, yeah, I'll get started on that. Make a note, Rick. All right. I already know there could be some good quarterbacks coming out in 2025 draft. That is that is the thing about what we do. We are so much better prepared for the future than we were before this podcast started. I think even you, because you had other irons in the fire. You weren't worried about the. I was. I was worried about was getting to the, the 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 upcoming draft and what we need to get done for the upcoming draft. I didn't even look at what the future drafts were going to look like. At this point in the process, in mid December. How many players were you familiar with, given that you traveled on Saturday sometimes to watch games and had some draft meetings, I would imagine, during the fall? No, we didn't have any draft meetings during the fall. Oh, okay. So the, a lot of the teams come in and they'll do – we had some backboard meetings in December. Uh, some of the teams just do the character meetings in December to kind of get that kind of all squared away. So teams do it differently. Usually I've probably seen maybe the top 50 – guys okay. by this time but there's so much work to go and a lot of times just because i i always felt it was important for me that when i went out on the road and i went to a game to watch live i was writing everybody i was even writing college for agents because i thought i had to get to know those guys a little bit just in case when they came up in the meetings 
<laughs> people used to go, why are you doing that? That's so what Dino says to me when he's doing the homework. Yeah, like 140 guys or 130 guys during the season. And it may be eight guys on Florida State and eight guys over here at Alabama or whatever it is. I would write all those guys up before I went in to watch them play live. So I had a pretty good library, even on some of the later round guys, not and nowhere near what the college scouts have done or what the college directors have done. But at least I had a pretty good sense and a pretty good feel. It seems like that and makes- if this podcast was going. I would have had a much better feel for it because okay. I would listen to this podcast twice a week when we uh, air the draft. <laughs> I will say it makes sense, though. I mean, obviously, you were very busy, but it makes sense to have an idea of the players you're looking at before you show up cold and you have no sense of what's going on, especially. I can't do that. No, I could never. Uh, maybe I wasn't smart enough to do that, but no, I you're, you're smart to, enough to go in and I wanted to know what I was going to be looking at and what yeah. to look for. So if I knew this guy had this weakness or that weakness, I wanted to verify that when I watched him live. And the other thing that why I like to go to live games was things you can't see on tape. You see on the sideline, you see in pregame warm-up. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, <clears throat> is I was a defensive end that went high in the first round, was the most bizarre pregame warm-up i ever seen. He never came out with a team. He came out on his own. He didn't even work out with the defensive lineman before the game. He was doing his own stuff. He walked in when he wanted to walk in. And... He started out strong, but eventually phased out just because he was like that when he got to the NFL. Huh, interesting. Yeah, and you'd like to see the interaction with a quarterback and a coach on the sideline. I mean, I've seen quarterbacks slam their helmets down uh, when they came off. Don't talk to anyone. Don't interact with anyone. Uh, I've seen other court. To me, the best sideline demeanor I've ever seen was Matt Ryan when he came out of Boston College. And... They, I was at the game. It was a night game. They played at Virginia Tech. They end up upsetting Virginia Tech that night, pouring down rain. But Matt Ryan was phenomenal along the sideline. And you can tell whatever that it factor was, everybody was rallying around him because he was the leader of that football team. Yeah, you said before that Matt Ryan was one of your favorite interviews when you got a chance to talk to him during the pre-draft process. Um, where are you on guys opting out of bowl games on the sidelines in civvies eating hot dogs during the game. <laughs> Let me see the opt-outs. <laughs> All right. 